I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. Hello, and welcome to Marketing Trends. This is producer Ben Wilson. This episode features an interview with Tom Buda. Tom is the CMO of SignalFX, and he's a multi-time tech CMO, also having served as the CMO for companies like Sprinkler, AppNexus, and Red Hat. This is our second interview with Tom. Our first one got really great feedback, so we decided to bring him back. And in this interview, Tom talks about why experience is the new brand and how to succeed as a challenger brand. Enjoy. Marketing Trends is brought to you by Salesforce Pardot, B2B marketing automation on the world's number one CRM. Are you ready to take your B2B marketing to new heights? With Pardot, marketers can find and nurture leads, close more deals, and maximize ROI. Learn more by visiting pardot.com slash podcast or click on the link in our show notes. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at Mission.org. And we have somebody coming back for round two. <laughs> Tom, what's going on? Hey, it's great to see you again. You guys are getting bigger and bigger. I know, indeed. And uh, we, we went so far into your background on V1 that we wanted to uh, to get to the second half of the interview uh, that I all the questions I didn't get to ask. So we're going to talk about why experience is the new brand to talk about challenger brands, and then some of the uh, lessons learned as a multi time CMO. What are you doing different this round? And what are you working on at signal effects? So anything else I miss any other stuff you want to talk about? No, that sounds good. Yeah, we spent a lot of time uh, uh, talking about my roots and how those applied to, uh, I guess, what's formed me today. So it was, it was actually a lot of fun. Yeah, good feedback on the episode, too. Thanks to all of our listeners. And anyone, if you have any uh, questions, as always, hit me up on, on Twitter at Ian Faison or, uh, or just email us at team at marketingtrends.com. Or if you have any questions for Tom in the future, he, he can, we'll bring him back. We'll bring him back for round three or maybe CMO roundtable in the not too distant future. So yeah, why do you think uh, experience is the new brand? Uh, it's a, actually a really big statement. Experience is the new brand. And the reason is because time has always told us that people never forget how you make them feel. And now that people actually have a voice to express how they feel, and that voice is social media, that voice is now heard, and that voice has power. Yeah. And so we've seen the power of social media in actually disrupting, you know, elections, governments, and brands. Uh, you know, you don't want to be trending number one on Twitter if your site is down and you're an e-commerce site. So that's what I mean by that. Yeah. You know, we just had Jay Bear on and, you know, the thing that he was most excited for going forward for the future marketing was CX. Like what a... You know, customer experience being the thing that you're most excited for. And it's interesting to think of it that way. You know, it's not a technology. It's not something that, I mean, it's tech enabled now. And there's tons of people that are doing a great job of it. But, you know, it is a, it's the best opportunity that I think marketers have right now to make a difference with their customers and know that their thoughts are being heard, to know that they're getting feedback in real time, to know that, uh, that people care about them, that it's not just kind of a brand. And I think that younger generations definitely feel that way. Why do you think that this falls under marketing or should it fall under marketing? It's actually the entire company. Uh, the entire company is really responsible for managing the experience that all of us have with a given brand. It's marketing's job to help manage the engagement that you have so that you're actually listening, right? You're first of all, you're reaching the people you need to be reaching. You're listening to what they're saying. And you're responding in a way that's personalized to them or individualized. So the worst is if you happen to call for help because you're having a problem with your bank or your credit card company and you happen to be a longstanding customer and they start asking you questions that they should already know the answer to and you have to re-explain entire, your entire scenario, that's extremely frustrating because the data is actually all there. They just need to access it and do something with it. You know, this reminds me, and I forget the exact ad campaign. I think it was Domino's where they had something, somebody tweeted at them was like, why does your pizza taste like cardboard or something like that? And so they, they screenshotted that the tweet 
and they're like, hey, we listened to you. Like our, our pizza tasted like cardboard. And so we, we went, you know, back in the lab, had our chefs work on the recipe, new recipe and came out with this new thing. And I think it's a really interesting idea of this. You can take the customer experience as, hey, it used to be bad and now we change and now we have a different focus. You didn't necessarily, I mean, you could use that stuff before, but now you can show the actual person and people do like put ads with those people in them. Like, hey, I'm the person who tweeted this sort of thing. I think that shows that they care. I mean, yeah, you know, it might not seem like much, but that's what gets someone to go, yeah, hey, Domino's changed their pizza. We should tr we should at least try it. We should give them another shot. I mean, we're all about comebacks, especially in America. Yeah, Tiger Woods. Yeah, yeah there you go, Tiger Woods. Yeah, but people never forget how you make them feel. So if you actually listen and you respond in kind, then they are willing to give you a second chance. And in fact, sometimes how you respond to something that was bad can actually make them an even more loyal customer than they might have been before. So I might have told you this as just another story, but McDonald's started using social media a few years ago. And they had never really listened to what their customers were saying. You know, they had a model, it was, it was like the operational efficient model on how to deliver product, but they never actually got customer feedback. All of a sudden social media comes along and there's just all kinds of feedback. And uh, some of the early tweets that they were getting were from people who said, hey, how come I can't get an Egg McMuffin at, you know, one in the afternoon? Yeah, which everyone knew. That's the funny thing. We all knew this. Like McDonald's breakfast was the best thing. Exactly. Like, yeah, everyone always talked about this. So like, there was this like accumulated series of, you know, responses from people saying, I really want to have an Egg McMuffin. And it, why does it have to shut down at, you know, 1030 in the morning? So their second biggest product launch of all time was the all day breakfast after the Big Mac. And the all day breakfast was launched via social media and they went and directly talked to, through social media, all the people that had ever communicated directly to them about wanting to have you know, an Egg McMuffin on another time besides the morning. So it was in that, it, that in and of itself got, got a lot of play. Yeah, I think that there is a huge opportunity for people to re-engage no matter how, I mean, now Twitter is, I, mean, I don't know, 10 years old. It's gotta be at least 10 years old. Maybe, no, it's older than that. Anyways, you can go back, like those tweets still exist. Like you can go back and, and add value to people and like, hey, remember when you said that thing in you know 2006? We're still here. And we're, we're, we're doing a better job of listening. Like people just want to be listened to. It doesn't matter if like, even if you're late, it's still, still valuable. What are some of those common mistakes that you see when it comes to brand experience and things that you see out there that people just kind of, when they don't really get it or things that you've seen in your career? Well, we can have an entire episode on, uh, about people who don't really get it, but I think mistakes, mistakes that brands often make is really not doing their best to leverage the power of information that exists in order to treat people like human beings. You know, CRM, customer relationship management, was a software platform. It really didn't do anything to improve the engagement that brands would have with customers. It just helped marketers find a way to reach certain target audiences. Customer experience management elevates that to the next level because of all this feedback that you can now get so there's no excuse really of not listening and then doing something about it. But I did want to, to take this to the present and maybe link it a little bit to what we're doing today. So the way I think about it is if experience is the new brand, the experience that people are having today are most often not necessarily with the physical product, the pizza, they're actually having an experience with a service, which is made by software. So it's a digital service, it's an app, it's an online store, right? It's a streaming media experience. And a marketer can't actually affect anything with that experience because the experience will be determined by how well that service performs. So a company today, when I said the whole company is really responsible, 
a company today needs to actually be able to monitor and observe the information on the performance of that digital service, and they need to do it in real time. And that's what we do at Signal Effects, right? And that's why that becomes really important. Yeah, and I think it's a critical insight that marketers need to know what it is that they're, what service that they're providing and making sure that they're hitting those talking points. But ultimately on this customer journey, what that looks like at month six, what that looks like at year two, what are those sentiments? What are those feelings? What are customers feeling at those different, you know, steps of the journey? Because I think that a lot of times when we're focused on acquisition, we're not necessarily focused on what it means to be like a lifelong customer or how long you would use this. And when you have something like what you're like what the team at Signal FX is doing, where you can monitor in real time and you can say, you know, this is the type of transparency that you provide year over year, it gives marketers more arsenal. It gives you an increased ability to share exactly what's going on, you know, in real time, like you talked about. Like, that's exciting. I mean, to, to me, that's exciting as a marketer to say, I now know what's going on in a way that we never did before. Yeah, well, it's exciting for the for the company because if you're able to monitor the performance of your digital applications, your your services, and you're able to monitor that in real time, then you can continually actually test new ideas. Getting into the challenger brand idea, you know, as you put out new ideas that do things slightly differently, you know, basically in real time how well those are performing and then ultimately how well those are being accepted. And that's why a lot of companies today are so young. I mean, think of who's been going public lately. These companies haven't been around very long, right? But they started out as kind of cloud native companies leveraging all of the, and we heard from Rajesh, you know, Raman talking about really the power of monitoring and, and visibility and the extraordinary intricacies that are involved, but the power that comes with that. Yeah. And these companies are born with this possibility. And if you can harness and leverage that possibility, and then you also happen to have good disruptive ideas, you can disrupt categories. Let's get in the challenger brand stuff, because I think that it's an interesting point. I think it, it'll tie into a lot of this. What is a challenger brand? And why do you think that this is so important right now? Uh, well, a challenger brand is typically, you know, it's it's a younger upstart. It is a, a brand that is is bringing about a new idea into an, a very established category. I might have mentioned that uh, when I was at Red Hat, uh, you know, we were introducing this notion of, uh, or at least leading the the industry around this idea of open source technology, right? Which today is commonplace. At that time, that wasn't the case. At that time, all we knew was what was known as proprietary software, where companies clipped the code to their software, to their Microsoft Word or Microsoft PowerPoint, or whatever it might be. They would hold that, and bugs would continue to occur, and customers would have their presentations and Word documents crash, right, time after time, until they introduced a, a bug fix a year and a half later. Well, open source allowed you to open up that code so that you can fix it as problems were occurring. And we were the ultimate, you know, challenger brand. We were challenging an entirely, an entire industry that it doesn't, you know, have to be this way. And the brand itself was, you know, challenging the leader of that industry, one of the most successful companies of all time, Microsoft. So the hallmark is you have a radical idea that nobody else really has. You're willing to take a stand uh, and be committed to it. And you create this, this notion of a lighthouse identity. So you, you sort of put out this notion that you stand for something important and you see if other people will respond to that. And just like a lighthouse, you'll wind up drawing people to it. And I might have mentioned earlier in a past discussion that when I took the job, you know, they said 
that the good news is we have 2.5 million users. Yeah. And, and, and the bad news is we don't know any of their names and uh, they're not paying anything for our, <laughs> our services. So I had to figure out how to harness that community of people so that they continued to believe in what we stood for because they demonstrated they believed in it by virtue of downloading our code. But I wanted them to become much more advocates for it. As you kind of mentioned, and actually, Jess is in the room right now, sitting at the table, lurking in the background, listening to this, because we just recorded an episode for IT Visionaries that you were talking about how SignalFX is the first ones to do, you know, this real-time cloud monitoring, which I think is so interesting because of this extremely complex thing that is kind of obvious when you say it of, hey, if you are running a ton of different applications and basically things are crashing uh, and you don't know why because you the monitoring system that you're using is not working correctly and this allows you to do that instead of five minutes of time your website being down it's it now could be uh you know seconds of time it's a very obvious thing i think to look at and say like wow that is exponentially valuable to a company that is you know where five minutes of downtime means millions of dollars how do you approach being a CMO at SignalFX differently than potentially other roles um, that you've had? The differences here are somewhat nuanced. So we're technically superior based on the architecture that Rajesh and team have built. That is something that no one else can do. And as a result, can't necessarily perform at the same level that we can. But that doesn't stop everybody else from using the same language of quote unquote real time. It doesn't stop everybody from saying that you can know more so you can do more faster. And so you have to actually get down into that next level to discover where there are differences. And oftentimes you don't discover that actually until you have a problem. And it's only then that you're now willing to then take another look and see, oh, maybe there's something better out there. So the challenge for me isn't necessarily saying, hang on, we've got this entirely new way. It's actually having to prove that as well because everybody else is making the same claim. So we have to find innovative ways to, to make, make that story come to life in ways that people can actually touch. I love that because that is very difficult. I, you know, it's something we haven't really talked about on the podcast before is this idea that your competitor is saying something that, just isn't true. You know what I mean? Like that they're, that they can't really, we're just is nodding his head uh, and next to the table here or at the table here. But it's a really interesting look because how do you go about that? How do you, how do you point out those things? Are you referencing competitors? Are you showing them on your website? How are you pitching those things in your campaigns? How are you you know, enabling your sales team to have the tools to show that like, hey, work, we work faster. Do you live stream uh, bake-offs or something like that? Like, what are the things that, how do you look at this, this problem to say like, hey, they're saying real time, but they're not really real time? Yeah, it's, it's, it is difficult. So one of the things we, we did prior to the launch of uh, the microservices APM product that we talked about in Rajesh's session is, we got out ahead of, the, of that product launch. It was a big deal product launch, right? It was a, we entered into, a, into an expanded space. We were able to correlate infrastructure monitoring with application monitoring, with digital business monitoring, all on the same platform. Never really been done before. But before we can even go there, we had to start out by talking about what the new requirements are and like literally build logic and put logic out there that pointed out, you know, why things were different <clears throat> and what the new criteria were, the new requirements were to be successful. And then we used examples of what's already out there and we sized those and we said, these don't necessarily work, do they? And we did that for like a month in a series of blog posts and other things until we launched our product. So we had sort of warmed the market with this criteria for what is necessary to win today. We compared it to what exists 
and then we introduced the solution. And the most important part was being able to have customers who said, we've been looking for this, we didn't know it could exist, here it is, and it works. And sharing those and sharing, sharing those, those stories. Absolutely. Or just, you need to uh, hop in here. But from from the architect as chief architect, what was kind of your your take on this uh, kind of on this product launch and what, what were you what were you thinking? Yeah, I think like Tom's got it absolutely right. So it's like a new product. Uh, and so we are trying to set the stage on what the capabilities of the platform are and to kind of like tell that story to people who may not understand the full landscape. I think we have one advantage when it comes to actually showing the product in front of somebody. Once you get the product in front of somebody, it's kind of a completely different experience. Because to see a real-time system sort of like streaming and you observe those dashboards as they change in real time. And we have this really nice demo where somebody can push a new container to their environment. Uh, we notice it and we start monitoring it within a few seconds. We notice oh, an nice. anomaly detection algorithm kicks in and it triggers automation that shuts that container push down and all this happens within a matter of 20 seconds. So when people see that, it becomes a very visceral thing. Uh, this is a capability that nobody can talk through because it, nobody else can actually do this or they cannot observe this kind of behavior anywhere else. And even outside the scope of the demo, to just see charts and dashboards that are streaming in real time over in one second, a second by second basis, I like to tell people it's the difference between watching a movie and watching a slideshow. And so once you get that in front of a person and they see it, then the questions, the whole picture becomes very clear in their mind and the differentiation becomes obvious. So I think that's kind of like, we really like to get the product in front of people. And all of Tom's expertise is to get that journey as quick as possible. Yeah, that's pretty great. One of the, one of the best demos um, I've ever seen was this company, I, I, they're actually right down the road, Proterra, their CEO, Ryan Popple, where he was showing me in real time how their buses, their fleet of buses, they're an electronic bus company in Utah, uh, in I think Salt Lake City, how much they were saving in real time compared to uh, diesel. And it was like, this is how much energy that we're saving. This is the actual cost savings to the city of Salt Lake City and like pulled it up while we were sitting there. And you're, you're looking at that type of capability. When you're looking at real-time monitoring and you're looking at something right then as the person, as the buyer, it is a completely different, like you said, you know, it's, it's the movie, not the slideshow. It's show, don't tell, right? I think all marketers want to show, not tell, but I think we tell a lot. We talk about product features a lot. We talk about in a lot of buzzwords. For something this complex, how do you think like you like to be sold to when you're, you know, potentially buying, you know, as, as chief architect, you, I'm sure you buy a lot of stuff internally and obviously your customers of, of yourselves. How do you want to be sold when it's something that complex? Well, I think the, the only solution is to meet the customer where they are. You have to understand the problem that they are facing and you have to cast the product in terms of how it will solve their specific problem. Because you can create a problem that, that signal effects might be facing, but they may not be able to relate to that problem because it's not the same scale, it's not the same scope. But if you can take a problem that they are actually facing and then you can show them how the product is going to fix that problem, that's how you, that's how you relate to, where the, to, to basically getting the customer over. And so you have to understand you know, what are their initiatives, what are their problems, and where are the challenges. So there has to be a little bit of that interviewing sort of phase going on, a little bit of background research that we have to do about that customer in order to convince them that we're going to solve that problem. If I, if I can just add to that, from a marketing standpoint, what we call that is identifying those use cases. Yeah. So what are those common use cases that people have and trying to get out ahead of that? Because these ideas are often brought to life by virtue of having lots of conversations and lots of experiences with us, a small set of, of companies who are willing to test these ideas with you you know, beta, alpha, beta customers, right? And once we understand how we're solving their needs and the kinds of problems that they're having and their unique situations, you can then see if that can be aggregated to be, you know, a smaller set of common ones. And then you could market to those. If you are experiencing X, Y, or Z, you know, here are some new ways to think about things. I, I think it's such a clear advantage to have a live demo that's, that's like that 
that's that good and a product that that's high quality. How do you think about accelerating time to demo? Because it seems like if your demo is that strong and there's other companies, other products who have really weak demos, <laughs> um, you know, or something, you know, for example, for us at, at Mission, like not really a demo situation where we more build something custom with someone, right? So there's no demo, not a technology product. For this, you do have a really strong demo. How do you shorten that gap to get them in the room with a sales rep where they can actually see this happen on their systems in real time? Uh, every meeting we have has to have a demo. So uh, Mark Granny made famous uh, in Ben Horowitz's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things About Hard Things, has an expression that he ingrains in the minds of every single salesperson at the company. Hide it, keep it, show it, sell it. So the point is, if you hide the product, you're keeping it to yourself. You're not exposing the magic. And we He refers to this product that we have as devastating. Show it and it will sell itself. Right? And so every meeting that we have, particularly early with a prospect, always features product demos. We allow as much time as possible to get into the product. When we go to these trade shows, we were at Google Next, this past week in, in San Francisco, we were at many AWS shows. Uh, we're going to DockerCon coming up here in the city. We're, we're basically everywhere and everywhere we go, we make sure that we have monitors, lots of monitors and lots of people to show demos. That's really interesting. So your field force is at any of those events, you're going to have like oversaturate on as many people as you can possibly have on ground doing demos. That's Are you right. random people stepping in? You get random employees like, hey, <laughs> yeah, or is it all, all sales? Or is that marketing? Well, no, no. It's just, I mean, well, we as marketers actually have to know how to do a demo, uh, the product marketing team, especially the technical, you know, marketing team. But no, we have, we make sure that we are, uh, we take them seriously and we, do what Rajesh said uh, earlier is we have the conversation with them first, understand you know what their problems are, or what their what their challenges are, so that we can customize the demo to have them experience it the way that they need to to get the most value out of it. You've uh, been a CMO multiple times, been around the block and done this a couple times. Have a few lessons learned under your belt. How did you think about arraying your your marketing team and how does that fit into sales? How does it fit into, you know, highly technical and, you know, a, a product that ultimately has, you know, a ton of patents is industry leading. How did you array this marketing team that you have in the, in the best way to, uh, to sell and market the product? Well, I was fortunate in being able to literally handpick every single person that's on our team. Unlike other experiences where I've inherited a team and, made a few adjustments here or there, really put the entire team together, you know, much like uh, Rajesh and Arjit and Karthik and others who started the company have done. We were talking about this on the way over. Uh, the culture of, of building a high performing, high integrity, collaborative organization isn't easy. And that was really, really important to me. So I focused on, on those characteristics and the people. But beyond that, I was coming in just after Mark Cranny came in because he brought me in. And Mark was responsible for really overhauling the entire go-to-market organization. And as someone with a sales, enterprise sales background, the first place he started, you know, was in sales. And so we were actually behind this extraordinary growth in our sales force. And so I had to quickly put in place resources that were enable us to feed the sales force. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So we put in place some technical product marketers that were able to create some content that could support what the sales force needed to get in front of customers. And then we put in place a growth marketing team to help amplify that. And that's a and, huge pitfall. I mean, that's a, that's a common startup pitfall is scale the sales team, don't scale marketing with it because you're just not going to get enough lead gen, you know, it and it depends how you're rate. If you have, a, you know, a dedicated outbound team, if you have inside reps, I mean, obviously a lot of stuff goes into that, but that's a potential pitfall to not have, not have that demand generation side of the business. Yeah. Well, we, 
Well, I think one of the great things about Signal Effects is we truly operate as an aligned organization. Like we spend half of our time with the product team and the engineers, spend the other half of the time with sales Salesforce. And when, when we're not in those meetings, we're out with customers. We had a team today that were with our inside team and our commercial team calling down on all of the opportunities that we had created in the last you know few weeks that were still open as it were and trying to fine tune how we can support them in getting the most value you know, out of those conversations and, and 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 interactions at the same time we had it we had meetings with the product team about what's next right and so we have to support the here and now we have to lead and then we also have to help pull the company to a leadership position in the in the market all of that is actually really hard to do. And if I over rotated on any one of those versus the other, I don't think that we would be operating as well as we are today. And we're actually going to have Mark, so a little teaser, we're going to have Mark on a podcast in the not too distant future to talk about some of those things. And I think that it's, it's really clear how, you know, unified of a front you have. For the folks that are listening that don't necessarily have that might not necessarily be able to pick their team that don't have such a you know lockstep with sales marketing product what would be your advice to how that marketer could could make a difference i mean i i i was asked this very question yesterday by the ceo of a company i'm an advisor to and you know they want to hire a rock star and they want that rock star to elevate that company and double their growth or help support the doubling of their growth. And I actually said, I actually think you need to start a notch or two below that, right? You need to hire someone who has these kinds of capabilities. So I think what you have in place here, you have a great product, you have the capacity to tell the story pretty well, but what you don't have is you, you don't have, you don't have any lead flow and you're relying on really, really big deals. And so what I think you need is somebody who knows how to do targeted marketing, ABM marketing. You have to understand what your scenario is yeah. in order to you, you, you know, pick the first place that you can enter because what you're looking to do is build foundation. And if you're able to get that right, then you can move into the next thing that will only make that stronger. Was there a specific like way that you wanted to look at lead generation, MQLs, SQLs, you know, sales accepted, uh, marketing accepted. How do you, how did you, uh, and I'm sure you worked with Mark on this at, when you joined, but how do you look at that relationship and, and the movement and whether it's, you know, sharing the band or however, however you, you all do it? Well, we look at it every day, right? So we have our own dashboards. Uh, one of the great things that I have today is I have the ability actually to know every single touch point that marketing and sales has made on a given customer. So we're able to identify the leads that marketing source that have resulted in a deal or the touches that marketing has been a part of that has influenced a deal. And so I know for a fact that we have well over 90% of total influence on all of our, of our revenue. Wow. And we have sourced directly a very significant portion of our pipeline. And so having, having that confidence in that data allows me to then look at all of the leading indicators that feed that. So <clears throat> whether it's the sharing of podcasts or yeah. like this or blog posts or content or uh, form fills to get gated content or website traffic or attendance of are regularly scheduled demos or special webinars or that kinds of thing. All of those sort of typical leading indicators I can look at and see how we can amp those to affect, you know, what we're doing. I'm gonna ask a loaded question. This is for both of you. I want I want both answers on this. Cause I think it's it's cool that we have you in the room. At a certain point when you have a great product, you've obviously like well past mar product market fit and all that sort of stuff. And you have things like that and like, you know, the close ratios are great and all this. At a certain point, 
is there kind of the sense in the company? It's like, well, of course, we just have a great product. It's like, of course, that many people are, are buying. Or of course, once they find out about us from marketing, I don't know who wants to take it first. But I, I, I just, I think there's a lot of marketers that listen that like might not have the best product. And then there's a lot of marketers that are like, hey, I, we, have a, we have an awesome product. I just wish I could get this in front of more people. So I'm just banging on the table to get more budget because I know that we can influence a much higher revenue percentage or whatever. Well, so in engineering, at least we feel that we have a long way to go. <laughs> oh, that's uh, right, yeah. So we've, we've done something interesting so far, but definitely our sentiment is that, that not least for me personally, I think we've only done about 10% of what our vision is. Uh, for this whole thing. And that vision continues to grow and expand, you know, as the landscape changes. There's just a heck of a lot of stuff that I think we can and we should be doing. Uh, and sometimes it's just, a, it's almost a little frustrating for me because, you know, we have certain amount of resources that we can bring to bear in terms of like the size of our team and, uh, you know, what are our immediate priorities. There's a lot of areas that I think we can and should be innovating on as well. Uh, but there's also stuff that you have to do to take care of our existing customers and, you know, just, just general product upkeep and so on and so forth. And so, you know, like there's always a mountain ahead of us to climb. And I think there's a lot of exciting work that I'm sure we will get to at some time. But in terms of actually saying, okay, of course, it's the best product. Like it's a good product. It can be a lot, a lot better. And I think we have a lot of really great ideas that we can bring to bear. So that's kind of like my take on it. I love that. Yeah, I... And that, that's also the kind of challenge that as a marketer uh, we have. So yeah. you can go all the way out there. Don't sell the roadmap. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, you can go way out there yeah. and paint a picture that is really exciting, but there's, there's, a, there's a big delta between where you are today and what you're talking about. Yeah. And frankly, with so much at stake, you can't afford to do that. You want to be able to paint a picture that you've been ahead, right? And you can continue to be ahead so that as people invest with you and march forward that you're helping to guide them, but not in a way that's so far a field that you don't, you can't believe it. Well, you, and I think we touched on this a little bit in the, in our first episode together, but you had this really kind of cool thing happen at a conference where I think it was CTO was talking about service mesh. Was that the all right, I forget, but you had a really, really successful uh, like piece of thought leadership at a conference where it, you know, like tons of people came, you know, oversold the uh, number of people that were supposed right. to be in the room and all that sort of stuff. And I think it's this this idea that we play with as marketers of like, what's the stuff that's happening right now? And what is, especially with a team like yours of brilliant people who have built a lot of really cool companies and been involved at a lot of really big companies that are working on stuff that's like way far out in the future, but also making sure that you're keeping, you know, your customers and and these prospects grounded in like what you're gonna do for them today. That's right. So, I mean, I often describe our challenge as twofold and you've more or less uh, outlined it. One is we have to support the here and now, right? And and we have to be providing the content and the the engine to support the business today we also have to help lead that business so that we're building a business for the future. At the same time, we have to be working with the likes of Rajesh and, and his team to understand where we're going because you want to be able to live within the frame that you're setting up. If you continue to change too radically, then you, you look somewhat schizophrenic but if you can create a positioning framework that allows you to to actually continue to grow within that, that's a good place to be. Yeah, I mean, number one rule of sales is confusion equals no sale, right? So if you have, and sales and marketing, if you have confusing messaging, if you're all over the place, they're just gonna be like, I don't, you know, this all sounds great, but pass. And then, then they're not going to go to demo, which is where we need them to be. How do you kind of deal with some of that that confusion? Uh, well, I mean, that's all there is, right? Yeah. There's, there's there's confusion because things are new. There's confusion because people say uh, different things about the same topic. You turn to the pundits, you know, you turn to the analysts, and they have a point of view. 
it isn't necessarily prescient. And so you continually- and they're not buying. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's always a place for someone who can make sense of things. I think our brand from a brand voice standpoint needs to be that, have that voice. If you think about the very derivation of the, the company name signals, right? We distinguish those signals that really matter, the ones that are different, the ones that you need to pay attention to, where the signals are of where the trouble trouble is. That's a clarifying when amidst this massive amounts of, of data, amidst this massive amount of complexity, that's extraordinarily clarifying. We can't have like content, right? Or we can't have our presentations be so complex that people actually don't get what you mean. Yeah. We should be the ones that actually can speak more simply and more clearly to help people understand. It's a great point. Thanks so much, Tom. You're awesome. And uh, special, we, we need to have you coming in uh, for the engineer perspective. We're going to do like the engineer's cor corner or something with, sure with Rajesh on. Uh, sure thing, I'd love it. Yeah. Um, that, that's the kind of stuff that flips my switch. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. But thanks, guys, for, for hanging out. And uh, yeah, we're just really excited to, to follow along with Signal FX. And um, yeah, like I said, we're going to have Mark on in the not too distant future. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, thanks so much. And thank you. Uh, really applaud what you guys are doing here. So thanks for having us both in today. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Marketing Trends. Marketing Trends is brought to you by Salesforce Pardot. World-class B2B marketers use Pardot to generate and nurture leads, close more deals, and maximize ROI at every stage of the sales cycle. Empower your marketing team to become revenue-generating superheroes and let Pardot's data analysis keep an eye on the bottom line. Learn more by visiting pardot.com podcast or click on the link in our show notes.